My name is James Wolfie. I'm one of the plastic surgeons at the University of Alberta Hospital. Uh, today we're going to be talking about facial bone injuries. Facial bone injuries are very common. They're usually blunt force injuries. Doing a facial bone exam is important because we can actually pick up a lot of injuries prior to any imaging. Uh, the most common facial bone injury is the nasal bone. That's the one that kind of sticks out, tends to get the, the brunt of the problems. And that is a clinical exam only. We don't do x-rays for, for nasal fractures. But the other fractures uh, that are common are mandibular fractures and zygoma fractures. And then lastly, the maxillary fractures. And those are, those are the injuries that if you pick it up on your facial bone exam, you can get further imaging, which typically is CT scans, and that will determine whether the patient needs treatment for those injuries or not. So to start off, before you do any kind of uh, history and physical exam, it's important to wash your hands, and I've already done that. So at this point, I'm going to introduce myself to the patient. Hi, James. Hi. Do you mind if I yeah, examine sorry. your face today? Sure. Okay. So the first thing after uh, seeing that a patient has a, a facial uh, injury is to rule out any other fractures. Okay. There's about a 10% correlation with uh, spinal and head injuries. So you want to make sure that there's no loss of consciousness. Uh, just you want to make sure there is no underlying head injury. You want to palpate the spine or have the trauma team leader or someone ensure that the spines are cleared prior to focusing on the facial bone. Okay because the facial bones can be fixed up to three weeks later without too much difficulty, but a missed spinal injury or head injury obviously is much more critical, okay? So, assuming that those, those, that exam is negative and we're just dealing with an isolated facial bone exam, we start mostly again with just a simple inspection. And you're looking for areas of bruising, swelling, any lacerations, and then after that, I usually move quickly to sensation. So again, we're not looking at the um, cranial nerve exam, but we're looking at where those nerves come out, okay? So most of the time we're talking about cranial nerve five, but what we want is basically their point after they're taking out from the foramen, because when those nerves come out of the foramen, those are weak spots in the bone, and classically facial fractures will go through those foramens and so the patient will get numbness in those nerve distributions. So one of the best ways of determining whether or not there's actually a fracture is by testing sensation. So first off, we test the forehead sensation. And again, we test both sides. And you feel that on both sides, okay? And that's usually the supraorbital nerve that comes out a little foramen on the top of the orbit, and it comes up and it supplies sensation to most of the, the top of the head. And so if there's a frontal bone fracture or supraorbital rim fracture, then you can get some numbness in there pretty uncommon, all right? Much more common is sensation here, okay? And then you get again, you test sensation over there and ask the patient for any numbness there. And that is your infraorbital nerve and that nerve comes out of a tiny little foramen in your zygoma. And any zygoma fracture typically will involve that nerve and the patient will get some numbness in their cheek and it also can affect the numbness on the top of the teeth. So I typically ask, you know, do you feel like your, your teeth are numb in the top? And then finally for the nerve supply is test the lower face, okay? And you test the lower lips on both sides, okay? If you can feel that, no numbness there, okay? And that's the mental nerve. And the mental nerve basically comes out of the mental foramen of the mandible. And within the mandible, it runs as the inferior alveolar nerve. And if the mandible is broken either through the, through the uh, foramen or anywhere in the body where that nerve is traveling, then that nerve uh, will will be bruised it'll, and it'll cause numbness in that associated area. So that's a great way, if, if you see that numbness in any of those areas, automatically you're thinking, hmm, there's likely a fracture, and that fracture is likely going either through the foramen or somewhere where that nerve is, okay? Next thing is you wanna test patient's vision, okay? And the vision should, also, should be tested with gross acuity if you have an eye chart, Okay. In a more acute setting with facial trauma, definitely you, know, you want to make sure that they can count fingers. How many fingers there? Two. Okay. On both sides? Two. One. Okay. Uh, so you want to do a gross acuity test. Uh, you likely want to shine a light uh, into the eye and test your um, pupillary reflex. But more importantly for the facial exam is we're trying to rule out an orbital floor fracture here and we want to make sure that the eye is moving, okay? 
And so I'm going to hold your chin steady, and I want you to just look at my finger. How many fingers do you see? One. Perfect. Okay, now just follow my finger. And so during this, you're examining the eye to see basically how it tracks. Okay, and it should be tracking nicely. And at the end, you should ask the patient, do you have any double vision during any of that? No. Okay, so you want to make sure there's no diplopia. Okay, so there you get your subjective and your objective. If there's an orbital floor fracture, then sometimes it can cause swelling of the inferior rectus muscle, and then that muscle doesn't work as well. And so especially on looking down, okay, the patient uh, doesn't move their eye symmetrically and they get some double vision. Okay, and that's a hint that there could be an orbital floor fracture. Some orbital floor fractures, more commonly in uh, the pediatric uh, patient population, uh, can, can actually entrap the muscle. Okay? And in that case, the eye does not move at all. Okay? And if you see that on your exam, that's much more of an acute problem uh, because if that muscle is actually entrapped, it is ischemic, and that is an emergency to get it undone. But those aren't eyes that just move poorly. Those are eyes that are quite fixed. And one of the other th ways that you can determine whether that eye is totally entrapped is by putting some tetracaine drops in that eye you're worried about and then doing what's called a forced duction test where you actually take a pair of pickups with the eye anesthetized and you actually pull up to see whether or not you can actually move it. And if it's fixed, okay, and the patient can't look up, okay, then you know that there's uh, an entrapment of that uh, inferior rectus and that's something that needs urgent treatment. The next most critical thing is your occlusion. Okay, so we want to always get objective and subjective. Okay, so first off, I'm going to ask you, when you bite down, how do your teeth feel like they fit together? Uh, good. Okay, same as before your injury? Yeah. Good, okay. That's usually the best, okay, because patients with normal sensation in their mouth, okay, you know when you have a, like a little tiny grain of of something in your teeth, you can feel it. You can feel how it makes your teeth go off. We're very sensitive to how our teeth come together. So if your teeth, if the patient tells you that they, it fits together perfect, then usually you know it's pretty good, okay? But you always also want to take a look, okay? I'll get you to open your mouth up for me. I'll put my fingers in there and then bite down, okay? And I can see basically the teeth come together very nicely, okay? have a very, very mild class 2 occlusion, but you can see how your cusp, bicuspid groups and everything come together beautifully, okay? Um, and so it's a nice occlusion, okay? So bite down again for me. Great, okay? Now open up again for me. So once you're in the mouth and you have your gloves on, you might as well finish your exam in here, okay? You look for any bruising in the mucosa, all right, any potential. If there is a mandible fracture, sometimes you can actually see steps and gapping in the teeth. Um, and so you're looking all through there. If there is a hint of a fracture in here, a lot of classical um, teaching will, will wonder whether or not that fracture is stable or unstable. So you can actually get your two fingers on both sides and see if you can rock the fracture, whether it's a stable fracture or an unstable fracture. That can be quite painful for the patient, so um, we definitely kind of want to get permission to do that if you think there is a fracture there. And then the last thing why you have your gloves on is you want to look for a Lefort fracture. So a Lefort fracture is a fracture of the maxilla, okay? And the maxilla is, has certain pillars, and we call them the lateral and medial buttresses. So first off, you want to examine those buttresses. So you put your finger up, okay, just on the side of the nose, and that's the medial buttress on the left side, and you palpate that and you feel if anything's tender, okay? And then you move your finger over to the lateral buttress, Okay, which is basically right where it starts, right that kind of prominence right before it drops off on the inside of the mouth, and you feel that, and if that's sore at all, okay? And so medial buttress, lateral buttress, and you do the same on the other side, okay? And then lastly, okay, you basically see whether or not their midface is stable. So I get you to open your mouth again, a little bit less, okay? And here you don't want to grab the teeth, because sometimes patients will have dental fractures and their teeth will be loose and if you start wiggling that all you're picking up is whether or not they have dental fractures or not. So you want to grab grab above the teeth in the alveolar uh, process of the maxilla okay and at this point you basically want to rock that okay and the Lefort one fracture which fractures down low across the, the 
the uh, lateral and medial buttresses on both sides, that can be quite unstable, and you can actually appreciate that whole upper jaw being quite loose. The four two fractures is a fracture that goes through the lateral buttresses and then up through the orbital rim and across the nose. And in those cases, okay, you can you can feel for maybe a little bit of rocking at the top of the nose over there. But some, a lot of times, that's more just the patient's going to tell you it's more tender. First off, I always start around the orbits, okay, and you start by gently palpating around the orbits and you ask the patient if anything's tender, okay? Okay, one of the common places like goma fractures are gonna fracture is through the, through the inferior orbital rim. And so you can gently press along the inferior orbital rim uh, for tenderness. And if the patient does state there's some tenderness, then you can push a little bit stronger after telling him you're going to because you can actually sometimes feel a step. And if the bone is broken and displaced, there'll actually be a step in that location specifically when you compare it to the other side, okay? The other place you want to palpate, okay, is along your is zygomatic arch, okay? Your zygomatic arch basically runs right kind of uh, in this location right over here. Underneath that is your temporalis muscle, okay? And that's why people have a, an isolated zygomatic arch fracture. They'll sometimes complain that they're having troubles chewing or they'll have some trismus because that temporalis muscle runs underneath of it and if it's pushed in in this location, it can actually partially impinge that muscle and cause some problems with chewing. So no problems with chewing? No. Okay. But more importantly, you can feel that, and again, feel for any tenderness and feel for any displacement there. Okay? And those are the main ones. And then the nose. Okay? So the nose, you kind of want to, again, take a look at, all right? And you want to make sure the nose is nice and straight. Okay? And you can palpate that to feel if there's any tenderness on the sides. Okay? And most importantly, you want to get an otoscope and you want to take a look inside the nose, okay? Because you want to rule out any septal hematoma uh, that may have developed, okay, from the blunt force injury. And that's important because that hematoma can, can cause uh, vascular compromise to the septum. And if it's not drained, then the septum will dissolve over time and the patient will get a sidal nose deformity, which is quite hard to fix. So if you're at all thinking that there's a nasal injury, you want to you want to take a look inside the nose to rule out a septal hematoma, okay? And then finally, uh, you basically, I like taking a look at the patient from, from behind to basically see whether or not you can visually detect uh, displacement in, in the zygoma itself. And so what I end up doing is I, I stand behind the patient, okay? And I want you to just tilt your head back just a little bit, okay? And so from the from behind here, you can really get a good idea of the prominence of the malar eminence. And again, if it's a significant zygoma fracture, then this will be pushed in, okay, compared to the other side. And you can also get an idea with the patient keeping their eyes open, okay, of the position of the globe um, uh, relative uh, to the orbit. So if it's a massive orbital floor fracture, the eye will sink in, and that's and that's uh, called anophthalmus, or if there's some significant bleeding, the eyeball will be more prominent on that side. And the Hertel exophthalmometer is the best way of looking at that, but in the acute setting, this works great in ensuring nice symmetry between the position of the globe and position of the malar eminence. And from here also, you can get a good idea of the uh, zygomatic arch as well. Okay. So, that concludes uh, your facial bone physical exam. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. To summarize, the first thing you want to do is rule out any head or spinal injury because those are critical things and there is about a 10% correlation uh, with blunt force trauma to the face. After that, it's nice to start with inspection. Moving on again to sensory exam, testing for the supraorbital, infraorbital, and mental nerve sensation locations. Then you want to test vision, and most importantly, in the cases for facial bone exam, for ocular range of motion and diplopia. Then finally, you want to move to occlusion, which is again critical to rule out any maxillary or mandibular fractures, and then palpation, 
rounds out your examination. And then at the end, it's always nice if you are able to stand behind the patient and just get a different perspective to ensure that there is no displacement or angulation from another angle. Thank you very much.